All right, hi everyone, I'm Jake Athey. I'll be your rebellion leader here today to help you fight the good fight against content fatigue. My purpose is to help you build your brand with intelligent content tools. And I'm Jay Pongonis, content marketer from Atlanta, Georgia, galaxy not so far away. Um, but I'm also our local in-house GAM Jedi. So I'm here to show you how my company, Hexagon Geospatial, leverages DAM to bring order to the chaos of the content marketing world. So yes, I look a little bit different than Mace Windu, a um, little bit more hair, but honestly, who wouldn't want to be Samuel L. Jackson? Thanks, Jay. Now why are you here? We're guessing you're here because you're challenged by scaling your content needs. You need a plan and a process for intelligent content, and you need a better way to improve organization with the content you have, as well as wanting analytics data that you can actually use. Now, if you don't need help with any of that, you may be in the wrong session, or we invite you to share your story here more later. But altogether, we want organized, easy to find content that is automating our workflows to help us be better marketing and communication professionals. Now here's what you can expect here today. We're going to come to terms with the content marketing wars, and we're going to get to know digital asset management. You're gonna hear damn a lot here today, and that's a good thing, so no worries, we're not cursing up here. But we're going to talk about why damn is important. And we're going to show you how damn enables intelligent content. And I'm here to provide the proof. All right, now just to set the basics, when we say digital assets, this is what we're talking about. Photos, logos, videos, marketing materials, all of the materials that you create that have value to your business. They're not just pieces of content that, that you would want to misplace. They have value because there's a high replacement cost if lost. They help drive revenues when used appropriately. And they may be reusable components or finished content products and compilations that have value for future repurposing. Now, content management systems help to manage and organize and publish your content. Quite simple, right? Well, there are a lot of system components that make up your publishing arm. We've heard about those today. But there are few technologies that are quite as capable and specialized as serving the visual content needs across the enterprise. And when it comes to content hubs that are often used and even pioneered by marketing teams, they're used across all of its members, from creatives to web designers, product marketers, and content strategists. But many other teams rely on that content hub to come together for your visual content. From media to agencies, your vendors, as well as sales and dealers, as well as your customers. And we know com companies are losing valuable resources with time, money, and content waste. A 2015 serious decision study reveals that only 35% of content created is actually used. And the rest is hard to find, irrelevant, or unknown. It's a waste. And according to Gleenster research, we recently saw on a CMI blog, that the average mid to large organization spends 25 cents of every dollar on content marketing spend on inefficient content operations. And that's nearly $200,000 annually per company on average. So while we're assembling massive content armies for our front lines, we're ignoring many of the necessary things that are needed to drive meaningful content engagement across the life cycle consistently over time. And it just got real. We are dealing with poorly managed content and we have too much. Who can relate? Who has that feeling of too much content? All right. Well, we have reached the tipping point, or we're far beyond that tipping point. The average marketing organization that we serve has 25,000 active digital assets in circulation and nearly 500 users that need access to this information at any one point in time. And there are many different people involved with putting your content to work. We're battling the content marketing wars. Scattered assets, siloed teams, disparate systems, slow response times, team turf battles across departments, content misuse and abuse, and many other daily struggles that leave us thinking there's got to be a better way. Enter digital asset management. DAM is the force, and DAM solutions store and retrieve everything, yes, 
and they allow you to use and reuse your visual content more efficiently. Dan gives 24-7 access to your rich media content. It's also your rebel base, your central command, to organize, track, and distribute your content across the galaxy. It unifies your team to fight the dark side of content disorganization. In short, Dan lifts your brand, saves crucial marketing costs, and improves time to market. Those are the benefits. But really what that means is it allows you to focus on the things that you care about, like creating quality content or working on that next big thing, which allows you to do the things that your leadership cares about, like driving revenues. Dan provides a single source of truth. We've heard that throughout the day, but it is a key mantra because without a single source and ability to push and pull assets from this authorized resource, you are not as productive or cost effective as you could be. Altogether, Dan provides organization, visibility, and connectivity of digital assets from a central source. It brings an awakening with an intelligent content lifecycle from planning to publishing. Dan enables intelligent content. It gives form and structure to the intelligent content process when it comes to using your visual content in conjunction with other systems. Dam is not a parking lot or a Java sand crawler. Do I have that right, Jay? Yes, right, yes. All right. But an integral part of your content creation, management, and distribution process. The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. This is like the mantra of this conference, right? So just because you have content and you're pushing it out doesn't mean that it's intelligent. It could just be jar, jar, jargon, boo, you can do and hiss at that one. <laughs> so, um, but Dan helps us cut through that and cut through the dross and figure out what's working. So as many of you know, these are the six elements of intelligent content. And when it comes to creating and growing rich, memorable, content-driven experiences, intelligent content is damn powerful. Intelligent content comes with well-described assets that are managed appropriately. And let's look at this in more detail. Dan provides intelligent content with six key drivers that all work together that support agile and scalable content processes. Structurally rich content comes with good metadata. Semantically categorized content comes with good catalogs and taxonomies. Automatically discoverable content comes with good governance. And reusable content comes with collections that are centrally managed. Reconfigurable content is made modular via automatic transformations. And adaptable content is web-enabled for repurposing from the central source. So if you take one thing from this session here today, know that DAM gives a framework on which we can build intelligent content. It's fundamental. Let Jay tell us more about how they use DAM at Hexagon Geospatial. So, it's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. Um, my job at Hexagon Geospatial is functionally content marketing manager. Uh, I oversee our blog, social media, communications, public relations, press releases, newsletters, website content, online community, and I manage the DAM. Probably about six other things that I've forgotten as well. So I have to do all of this with a team of two. So we're really faced with a challenge for doing that um, effectively and quickly. We have to react quickly. So how do we accomplish so many things? A lot of ways it, it's enabled by our dam. The dam gives us a single place to go and find all of our assets. It's kind of like the Millennium Falcon. It may not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. So uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about my company and our customers. Hexagon Geospatial is part of a larger company named Hexagon. Historically, it's a measurement company. They measure everything from micrometers. They make, they make products that measure the percent of variance on Formula One cars, all the way up to measuring kilometers or with aerial scanners and drones. So where Hexagon Geospatial fits into that is that we write the software it takes the sensed information about the world, converts it into a digital world where you do all of your analytics and analysis and your planning, and then you go out and change the world. And then that cycle starts all over again. So that's where we fit in. From images, we create land cover maps, road maps, tax parcel data, 3D surface models. 
So we have a global company, we're a global B2B company, we have over 300 employees scattered across the world in 19 countries. But more than that, we are a partner-focused company. With over 190 partners around the globe, I have to be able to find a way to get access to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that they can get the marketing assets they need to feed their sales channels. And as we all know, right, different countries, different cultures, different languages, they have to be able to get all of that, download it, translate it, co-brand it, and I have to be able to make sure that all of our marketing standards and our messaging is consistent across the globe. We use this, this is why we use the dam. So from a traditional standpoint, we have 15 product lines in, in these, these three categories. This is our traditional B2B product lines. We sell photogrammetry, remote sensing, GIS, a bunch of stuff none of you have ever heard of, probably. <laughs> um, but we sell this to big customers, departments of defense, departments of transportation, conservancy, um, con uh, conservation agencies, governments, air photo collection companies. These are all kind of old school companies. So um, we're pretty good at that. We know how that works. But this past November, we changed how we function. We still need to focus on those B2B customers, but we launched something called the Hexagon Smart Map. So we're moving from B2B to what I invented for this slide, which <laughs> is B to D to C. That sounds like a droid name, but it's business to developer to customer. So we want to take all of our technology package it up, put it on the cloud, and let people who don't understand geospatial build a solution, build a map-based answer on application, an M.app, app, and then sell that to customers. So we have to change the way that we think about our business to reach this new market. So, we have a new challenge. We have our traditional customers up here in the orange, natural resources, agriculture, governments, transportation, defense departments. But we have to figure out a way that we can get marketing assets and reach out into all of these non-traditional partnerships, into the people who have technical knowledge, but not geospatial knowledge. And in a sense, that starts with our dam. What sorts of things do we do to do this? Well, last year, we had a simultaneous product launch of 15 product lines. We had, in conjunction with that, a world tour of 25 cities. We had a global conference, one right up the road at the MGM Grand in June, one in Hong Kong in November. Uh, we have launched a new website. It was pretty easy. Uh, trade shows, over 50 trade shows. We also beta launched a partner uh, community or a partner forum. Uh, we also created e-training videos for our customers across all of our product lines, over 50 of those. Some, some employee videos, giving the face to Hexagon Geospatial, newsletters, blogs, social media, all the stuff that we all do. So how, what do all of these have in common? Well, damn, if I know. <clears throat> was a, life before damn was a wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> So if I wanted to go out and find something um, in the dam, or before the dam, if I wanted to go out and find a marketing asset, go forward, then I would have to go out and find those shared network drives, find SharePoint, I have to guess at file naming conventions, uh, run random wildcard searches, right? It was all a bunch of simple tricks and nonsense. So, but it, it could work, right? People could go out and find what they were looking for. It was like the Moss Eisley Cantina. If you knew what you were looking for, you could get in there and get it. But most people were lucky to get out of there without losing an arm. So, when done right, the size of the dam doesn't matter. 2.7 terabytes of data, 27,000 assets, but I can get people to get the information, over 65,000 downloads, over a million uh, embedded views. People are finding what they need in, that, in the dam. If you, if you, finding a needle in a haystack is easy. Right? Finding a droid on Tatooine is easy. 
if you have the right tools. If you're not using the Jawa sand crawler to just kind of pick up stuff as you go by and chunk it in hoping that someone might use it later, right? The dam gives you the ability to do this with structure and intention. Thanks, Jay, for the hexagon intro to really understand hexagon means to really understand the need for intelligent content. We hope you're starting to see why DAM is so important to intelligent content, especially when it comes to a global organization like Hexagon. Now, it's also important to know that this process of intelligent content is people-driven, not software-driven. So today, we're gonna to going to get into some of the people-driven and technology-assisted components of DAM that support your content operations. Starting with governance. Governance enables discoverability. To find, retrieve, prepare, and publish content. Now there are two aspects of digital governance, and we've talked about some of that today. But one is simply access and use control rights. And the other is related to process and oversight of all the functions and responsibilities from creation to distribution. So as you think about your governance model, whether you have one or not, you're about to create one, you need to think about all of the requirements and those responsibilities for each distinct group of users, contributors, producers, and everyone that make up your content model. Your team needs to create a clear governance plan with a, with a very clear documented governance strategy in order to make your content truly intelligent. Jay, tell us more about Hexagon's approach to governance. You have failed me for the last time, Admiral. So if you ask your average user what they need access to, they're going to tell you everything all the time. As an administrator, I know that they don't need access to everything all the time. By actually controlling their access, I'm setting them up to be able to succeed. So really, and I mean, it is kind of fun to deny people access to stuff anyway. I may or may not have some Sith in me. So how does this look for Hexagon Geospatial? Here's a little glimpse into our governance model. We have all of our internal employees and they need access to stuff in the dam. We want them to have access to the templates, the PowerPoint templates, the approved Word templates, all of this sort of stuff. They need access to all of that, but they don't need access to everything, right? If they go in and start searching, they're gonna find stuff that, that branding things that they, they don't need, we don't want them to, to necessarily download and be using that. So by doing an asset level security, I can ensure that everybody gets access to what they need and they only get access to what they need. So do sales need to be able to upload into the dam? Maybe they do. They're out at trade shows, they're taking pictures, they're, they're showing our customers, they're interviewing people. Maybe it makes sense to let them upload stuff. Now I don't want them just dumping everything into the dam, so using a proper governance model, I can have them upload into an area that then I can go in and I can vet, right? I can go through and look and see, well, I know who these people are, we don't want to show these people. So I can go in there and put like a sanity check on stuff before it goes into the dam. So these give us a great access to limit control to the assets. So how does this play out in the real world, right? I have over 190 partners. We brought nine new partners in last year. So I had to do an onboarding for these partners. I had to give them access to all the stuff to get them up to speed. So now we have training partners and we have non-training partners. We have value-added resellers and there are all of these different kinds of partners. This doesn't fit in my head. I don't need to know this. So what I can do is I can take all of our partner assets and because each one of those asset level things is assigned a security grouping, I can just dump them all into one big collection. So when they go and log into the dam, I, they all go to this same partner onboarding collection and they only see the things that they have permission to see. Now, another great thing that we do is uh, for certain levels of partners, we give them access to our CRM. So what we can do is they can go into the CRM, they can log in, the CRM understands the partner, the partner level, the partner information, are they a training partner, are they not? So the CRM understands all of that. So they have a single sign-on, they click on one link from within the partner, they go into the dam, they only see the things that they have permissions to see. So this is really about getting the information to them, they're in the CRM already, 
make it easy. If you make it easy for them, they will call you and ask for help. So it's about getting the right assets to the right people worldwide. The next key part of our model is that metadata means content is structurally rich. It gives assets meaning. Metadata is critical to the intelligent content model and supporting content use across the enterprise. We're talking about that here. Metadata, quite simply, is how you define, describe, and protect your IP or your intellectual property assets. It can help us understand who created it and how it can be used and repurposed. What are the rights? For what purpose do we have originally? And what purposes can it serve down the road? Now, when it comes to metadata development, we won't lie, it can be, it can be a daunting task. It is work, and Jay can attest to that. But there are ways to automate that. You can scrub metadata from stock photo site downloads, or you can integrate with other systems, whether it be product information management or other sources of this data. As content marketers, you may also include personas, life cycle, and emotions as metadata, but know that those closest to your company, your culture, your product, your brand, or all of the things that represent your asset variety are going to be those that have to put in the work with metadata. Jay to share more about their approach to metadata at Hexagon. Met meta, so I, I have to say that when, when Jake said, uh, Jay, we're I want you to come and speak at this conference and we're gonna be talking about Star Wars, right? This is the first quote that popped into my head. Right? This, is, this is how our company used to, used to try and find assets, right? We'll figure it out, we'll use the force, right? We have a system and it works for us. And, and it does, it did work. But the problem with that is that A, that's not how the force works, and B, it doesn't scale. We have a system, we understand it. When you're bringing in 190 partners, are they gonna read that system? Are they going to understand it? Mm -hmm. My guess is no. So uh, metadata, as Jake said, is the, is the hard work, right? Metadata feeds the search. It makes everything work. But metadata and caretaking the metadata is slogging through the swamps of Dagobah with a pushy little creature on your back while all your friends are having fancy meals on Bespin, <laughs> right? But if you do it right, and if you spend the time to understand your user, then you can go in and create a metadata, metadata system that works for you and for them. So, while I'm paying attention to the details and I'm digging through, I'm figuring out how people are using the system. What are they searching for? So I can go in and then adapt our metadata to go in and fit what they, fit what they work. When we started out, uh, I went in and I started looking, okay, what's the most common searches? And everybody was searching product names. Right? And then they would call me and they would complain because they got X thousand of returns. How am I supposed to find anything in this? So I went into the metadata and I adapted it. I said, okay, product name is now a pull down over here. Right? So you go in and you search for something, whatever your campaign is, smart cities. Okay, search smart cities. And now I can go over there and select product name on the left hand side. So if you go next, this is what that looks like. Right? The, the number one search in our dam last month was Ignite. We're running an Ignite competition. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I went out and found that, okay, what does that look like? So by using smart metadata, I can go in and say, all right, they search Ignite, they get 118 returns. Now I want to filter that out. So on the left-hand column, we can go and say, only show me the images. I'm trying to find an image. So filter out on the images. Okay, now I want to find externally shareable. So I do externally, so 30, 30 returns. Geospatial related, 14 returns. Bang, like bullseyeing womp rats in my T16 back home. Jake, <laughs> what's next? Taxonomy semantically categorize your content. Now in many systems, cat categories are a popular form of classifying assets in different sets, in limitless ways, not like your folder structures today. They do represent a hierarchy for content organization, and they help users start their search or their browsing session without knowing exactly what they're looking for, as opposed to some of the category searches or the keyword searches. But they are a, a good form of structured content when it comes to 
understanding how your users are going to search. Look at things like your website or your e-commerce information architecture to offer a familiar experience. Or consider your CRM and marketing automation systems as other systems that may use your taxonomies. Jay, to share more about their approach. So if you're going to talk about Star Wars and searching right, you've got to say these aren't the droids that you're looking for. That's got to be in there somewhere. So uh, how does this play out in terms of categories, a different way of searching? So if I want to find droids, right, maybe I only want to look for astromech droids, right? I don't want those chatty protocol droids. They get on my nerves. They just talk way too much. I just want astromechs. So I can go into those categories. I can go in. I can search droids. Astromex, it's going to pull up all of them and say, oh, I only want to see the BB units, right? So I can then type a search within that category and just narrow it down to BB units. I can find out if BB-8 really is unique. Maybe there's another one out there. I don't know. But if I do this search within the dam, I can find out. So uh, what are some, some other ways, Jake, some other ways that we can facilitate access to content through the dam? Yes. Now, collections, as Jay mentioned briefly, offer an intelligent way to curate groups of content so that it's more reusable by all the many users of your dam. And you can use collections to curate groups of content for campaigns and events, as well as products, brands, media kits, and, and more. Now, it offers a good cross-check of content organization different than category, categories, uh, without the hierarchies. Collections are defined by their purpose of creation or intended use, and they make it easy for reuse by a lot of your users external to dam. So, for example, with Jay and many organizations we work with, they'll provide a collection of product photos that will be used with an email marketing blast, with brochures, with a mobile app, and a web page. You can distribute that for one central source of distribution where everyone comes together. Jay, to show more about their use of collections. So one way to think about a collection as different from a category, right? If you're going into categories, you're going to find X-wings, Y-wings, a wings, right? Maybe what I want to do is establish Rogue Squadron, right? I need some fast ships, so I need some A wings. I need some heavy duty fighters, so I need some Y wings, and it's not a Star Wars movie if there aren't X wings in it, so I got to put some X wings in there, right? So a, ca a collection, sorry, a collection is where we gather up all of these assets that are getting ready to go out and be deployed to do a mission. So we're collecting up all of our assets into our campaigns. So I can collect all of this up, it's all in one place. I can take that and say, okay, now partner X in India, you're getting ready to do a smart cities campaign. Here it is, here's all the stuff that you need to do. So a collection is kind of like the, the staging area. It's the spaceport, it's where I'm gathering up all of this stuff and saying to my partners, when you get ready to run this campaign, here is where you find all of the assets that we have around that. What, what does this look like in the real world? I talked about Ignite for a while. So we, we launched our Hexagon Smart Map thing. So what we want to do then is we want to find the people who have the disruptive ideas. right? We want to find these people, and one way that we're doing this is through crowdsourcing. Right? We want all of our engineers to contact their professors. We want them to reach out to the groups that they talk to and say, do you have a great idea? Right? We'll give you $100,000 to get your idea off the ground. We want to teach you how to use it. So this is this Ignite competition. So how do we, how do, if we're going to crowdsource, right? you've got to have a crowd. So we wanted to get this up and running really quickly. So how did we do this? We went out and we found all of the Ignite information and we created a collection. So this is a curated collection of things that we say, this is good to share. This is good to share wherever you want it for however, whatever audience you're sending it to, right? So we've got some social media cards in there. We've got videos in there. Videos are always good to share. We've got PDFs explaining what an Ignite session is, what can you expect. All of these different kind of assets are in there for our employees to reach and see, download, put it on their social media feed, and share it out. So it's a way for them to reach out to their connections and be really the employee advocate and drive people to our training sessions for Ignite. Now transformations in DAM enable reconfigurability. And that is the power to transform image, audio, and video formats from one master to other formats on the fly. 
And that is one of the top specialties of DAM. You can transcode virtually any format, audio, video, image, to any other format needed for an editing program, a channel, or any user's needs. And there's no need for everyone to have multiple tools like Photoshop to carry out everyday content functions. Now this feature is even more powerful when it comes to feeding the right formats to other systems, not just the people who need those assets. DAM sustains the quality and the integrity of your content with uh, version control to minimize copies and version control issues and control all the iterations in one source. Jay, to share more. Only a Sith Lord deals in absolutes. Uh, although we've heard it time and time again here, right, the single source of, source of truth. We want that one place where we start from, where you can then take that and pass it out. Now, one of the ways that we use this at Hexagon Geospatial is with our e-training videos, right? Our product teams record the raw videos, they give that to us, we slice that up, we punch up the script, we put a voice over all of it, we do all of that kind of work for them, and then we put it into our dam for our partners to get access to that. But they might need to subtitle that, right? They might need to, they want to put a, a voiceover on it and put it on their website. So we have them access, we give them access to be able to download it. But we want to make sure they're downloading it in a format that they can then edit. So we don't want to keep a bunch of different versions of the same thing, right? Oh, well, we changed this video, we added this piece in, right? So now we've got to replace it in eight different ways. No, no, that's not intelligent. So through the dam, they can go in and select the one thing, go on to the next one, that, that one version that they can edit. So then they can download it and put it onto their website. Now, another thing that I like about this, it's not really uh, talking about this specifically, but if you see down there at the bottom, right, there is the script. It's not another asset out there. So you don't have to download this video and then go find the script and download that. It's attached. It's attached to the asset right there. So they can go and get that script. So now they are jump started in their translation process. Closely related to transformations, web enablement enables DAM to be an integral component to scaling your content. You can dynamically resize images and videos with an embed code to fit virtually any web destination. This makes content uh, intelligent to be shared across multiple websites while maintaining that central source to minimize all of the version control and, and tracking issues that may happen. You have that one source for tracking as well. And it makes content adaptable to go omni-channel. Big word, but meaning you can go beyond print, web, and mobile, but feed every channel, every platform, every device and team that needs your content from your central source. So in short, digital asset management enables you to deploy the right visual content to the right channel in the right format at the right time for the right audience. Jay, to more about how they do that? Haha, the other quote you knew was going to be in here, right? Do or do not, there is no try. This is, this is the marketing mantra that I hear all of the time. So, like a lot of you, I'm sure that you manage a bunch of different channels. So, we have our .com website, which is our homepage is very heavy on images and videos and, and things like that. Now, kind of buried down in there, we take all of our case studies and we can take those straight from the dam and we can embed them into branded web pages so that we have, they have access to all of this and they can click a button and download, download that. But we're making sure that it is consistently in our brand. Uh, also, we have our e-commerce store. So again, these are using logos and images that I need to make sure are consistent, right? that we're consistently using the same image uh, to represent that product in each one of our things. And that's not just the logo, but the associated imagery as well. We also have our WordPress blog. So I need a way to be able to get imagery into our blog. Again, ensuring that consistency. I'll talk a little bit more about the blog in a second, but I do want to skip over our community, which is in beta, so it's no longer called Developer Network. It's community because that brings people together. So, um, but again, we have the same products. We have the same product lines. We need the products and the logos and the associated imagery to be consistent. And each one of these kind of stick to the same guidelines, but maybe not necessarily. So, how does this, how does this play out uh, from the dance side? 
from the web enablement side, we have three basic use cases. So we have two major uses. We have uh, feature images, so on the blog side, if you will click next. Uh, oh, can you can go back one. Or did they all come in together? I think they all came in together, okay. We have feature images. Feature images are essentially a one-to-one -one ratio, right? The image in the DAM is the same size as it's gonna be in the web page. So there's no transformation needs to happen there. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. But we also have what I call named transforms. So this is, plays out in one way with our WordPress blog, right? I know that the header image for a blog is 702 pixels by 336 pixels, but they want me to use stock images to do that. But uh, So I go out and I have to go into the, in, into the dam and download it, and then I've got to resize it in Photoshop. No, 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 no. I don't have time for that. So there's actually a plugin for WordPress where I can go in and say, okay, insert from, from the dam, do a search, search for windmills, and then I can go in and say, okay, now I don't want to type in the pixel dimensions anymore, so I set it all up and say, I need 336 pixels by 702 pixels, and I want you to crop from the center. And so now I just go in and say, search for windmills, because that's what they wanted me to use pictures of for a long time. Select that name transform, and now I can insert it straight into the WordPress media library, or insert it from, from a link. So, very simple, cutting down all my work effort. And then there is, the last one are the one-offs, right? If we're, if we're publishing an article in a magazine, they have their own specific dimensions for an image that they need. I can go into the dam, I can find it, I can set, type in exactly what they needed, the pixels dimensions that they need, and then I can just send them a link. I don't have to download the file, and then send it to them to upload it, send it to them to download, right? I just send them the link directly, they download the image, it's exactly what they want, fingers crossed, hopefully that's what they wanted and then I'm done. So all of these one-offs, I, I can do those very easily too. Thanks, Jade. Now you've seen how the six elements of intelligent content are enabled by digital asset management for greater organization, visibility, and connectivity of your digital assets from this central source. Now in our last bit, we want to take a closer look at analytics. Content insights and analytics offer a great supplement to your enterprise data and your web analytics platforms. It's how you track, measure, and report content performance across channels. Now it's also how you can understand how assets are being used across different user groups and individual users, as well as across geographies and different websites. It's really quite powerful. You can also use it to identify your top performing or your underperforming content for future planning and budgeting decisions that you need to make, as well as guidance for the daily tasks that are needed in cleaning up your dam. Here's Jake to share more about their use of insights. Uh, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1, right? To which Han Solo immediately yells, don't tell me the odds! But we all know as marketers that we need to know. We need to know those odds. We need to know what's working and what's not working. So the DAM dashboard is a way that we can go in and we can customize um, our, our assets. So we can go and we can create analytics based on exactly what we want to see. What we're looking at here is a, a real-time view of how our e-training assets are performing. So I can go in there and I can see exactly who is downloading things, who are the top downloaders for the past month, for the lifetime, for whatever. I can go and I can see what is getting the most views, what, what's getting views, what's getting played, what's not getting views, right? I need to know that because either I have to promote them or there's something wrong with it, we need to pull it out. But also, I can get a geography, right? For these e-training things, then I can look at the e-training videos and say, hey, we're getting a lot of hits from Rome. Why is that? You can figure that out. Or if we're going to do our world tours, right? I want to go out and see who's watching e-training videos. Who's getting these assets? So then we can use, we want to feed that information when we go in to schedule the world tours. Where is the interest? Where is this coming from? So I can go and I can pinpoint where those world tour um, events will be most effective and best attended. So. That's kind of an asset level analytics. So just like the dam gives us asset level, level analytics, Google Analytics, I can hook my dam up to Google Analytics, and that gives me behavioral information. Right? This is where I can go in and say, what are people searching? What are they looking for? What are the top searches? 
is there a problem with that, right? If everyone's going in and searching a product name, maybe there's a, prob a problem there. Maybe they need to, I need to educate them and say, all right, look, another pull down list. Maybe you want, want to use that, search something you want, right? So I can go in and I can find out how the name's being used, and then I can use that to tailor my decisions about changing the metadata, changing, changing the locations, changing the assets, what's working, what's not working. So all of that information then helps me make sure that it is best being used for the user experience. So there has been an awakening. Have you felt it? I felt it. Did you feel it? I felt it. <laughs> So that and gives, I also, I, I just got to say, I had to put Ray up there because Ray is awesome, and I scored lots of bonus points with my daughters for putting, putting a picture of Ray on this. That gives a good overview, Jay, of how DAM brings about greater organization visibility and control across Hexagon when it comes to your visual content. Now, we do have some time for questions, about five minutes, if you have any questions about digital asset management or Hexagon's business. Go around. I know you talked about uh, visual content, you, you only have an hour or however long. What about social content? Do you use it for social? Um, we do not currently use ours for social. Do you know examples of, of people? Well, we treat digital asset management as like the central hub for publishing content to any channel. We do have integrations, and we see DAMs have integrations with different uh, social channels, but it's more common that assets will be uh, shared from a platform like Hootsuite or HubSpot, but the dam will allow you to get the right sized imagery uh, in the right format for those social channels. But we do have many customers that are centralizing different cards for, for social channels. There is the ability to share directly to social channels from within the dam. So we, we can go in there, um, and we have, we have hooked it up to our Facebook account and uh, YouTube channel, right, or whatever, so we can take that and, and push it straight from the dam out to the social channels. Um, we, we uh, I can't get management buy-in on that. They, well, we've got this other tool, we need to use that, so. I was just said the, the follow-up is because we have a large potential community who could come in and use the social that we create mm -hmm. on their channels and adapt it. Are you using your DAM system for just the final assets or are you using it for the project workflow for each asset? Uh, we use ours primarily for the final assets, although in, in our case, final assets can be um, InDesign files which are ready for co-branding. So we can go in there and do it. And there are abilities to, um, it has a commenting, a pretty good commenting function in there. So you can say, hey, you know, this file is ready, ready for you, you know, tag somebody and it, it can be used that way. Um, but my team is really small. So we all sit in the same room so we just shout at each other. If, if you're making those editable files available, AIs, in design docs, that kind of thing, how do you keep people from mucking them up? We, every time I try to send somebody to some, or something to somebody, I always end up seeing it used where the, it's distorted or it's pixelated, or the, you know, I, I'm working with Camera Raw and they say they want you know, an image for Facebook or something. How do you keep them from messing that up? Um, well, I guess the answer for that is we don't. Um, we, we primarily deal uh, with professionals. Our partners are all professionals. They all have, have professional video people that they, they get in there and use it. You know, I don't think to speak more to that. It really comes down to training and ensuring that people know how to use the tool to get the formats they need and can use those appropriately. Time for one more. Is the dam the primary source of serving your content? Is that how you're getting the measurement? I mean, is it is it your web content assets? That the, all those assets are served directly to your web platforms that way? Uh, it was. Um, okay. um, we, as I said, we, we launched a, a website 
um, this year. And that was kind of our parent company said, guess what? Everybody gets to move to Sitecore. So, so we all moved to, moved to Sitecore. And um, we had the fewest number of web pages on our site, so we got to go first, which was very painful. Um, but moving forward, there, there is a Sitecore integration. And, and Jake and I have been talking about that, about a way of more closely coupling up um, our dam with Sitecore and using that as a way to uh, push content back over into our into our Sitecore website, um, which I think is a fairly new a fairly new thing. So, so then all your analytics are coming from Google. Yes, um, we well well that's yes and no um, for our <laughs> e-training. And, and things like that. So information that's in, in the community, we, we use the dam to get the analytics for, for all of those things. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Jake Eady, Jay Pongonis.